Then, in our day, they were heard again through the miracle of radio, and this time the whole world listened. At the time, I was head of European programs in Egyptian state broadcasting, and on a blustery February morning in 1939, I caught the director of the Egyptian Antiquity Service, Monsieur Etienne Trioton, off guard, and he agreed to cooperate. The broadcast was to take the form of an interview in which I would ask Alfred Lucas, a much respected figure in archaeological circles, and oddly enough, in the world of criminology to recall the scene of that historic opening of Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings in 1922. Lucas was the last survivor of the little band of men involved, and so to the trumpets themselves. They are still displayed in the Cairo Museum. They are unique in that nothing like them has been found before or since. Seemingly, they are in perfect condition. One trumpet is of beaten copper, and the other of silver, chased in an intricate design. Being only 18 inches long, they are very difficult to sound. A professional trumpeter was obviously called for, so auditions were held, and the choice fell on a bandsman from one of the British Hussar regiments then stationed in Egypt. As the proposed date of the broadcast approached, letters began to come in. Many among them drew attention to the much-publicized curse of Tutankhamun. In lighter vein was the headline in an American newspaper, Touch Toots in Tootle Round the World. <coughs> we know the sort of thing. The broadcast was now only two weeks off. First attempts to blow the trumpets resulted in ear-splitting discord. Musici musicians assured me the instruments had been designed to sound only one note, or at most two. Nevertheless, I was determined to make them produce a simple tune, and this would call for three or four. Rehearsals were held in one of the workshops, well away from the museum itself, so that the noise would not disturb visitors. It was on the morning of the second rehearsal that the curse struck. The bandsman was making valiant but unsuccessful attempts to extract three notes from the copper trumpet, while Rex Engelbach, the keeper of the museum, and I stood by watching and trying not to hear. The door opened and in walked King Farouk. Paying an unofficial visit to the museum and hearing the extraordinary noises, he had come along to investigate. He was accompanied by the director of antiquities, Engelbach had once moved to greet the king. Out of the corner of my eye, I had seen the bandsman, not one jot put out by the king's arrival, pick up the silver trumpet. Then came the sound of a sharp blow, followed by a tinkly noise. We spun round as one man. There, a picture of stupefaction, stood the bandsman, in his hand only the stem of the trumpet, the rest of that priceless relic lay around his feet. A moment of stunned immobility. Then all of us, including the king, were down on our knees in the dust, searching for fragments of silver. At the time, the disaster seemed inexplicable, but later it was discovered that the silver had become crystallized with the passage of the millennia and was as brittle as glass. The bandsman, and had the not unintelligent notion of fitting a modern bugle mouthpiece into the neck of the trumpet, but finding that the orifice was too small, he had rammed it home with a flat of his hand. In silence, we laid the pieces of silver on the table. King Farouk looked at us in concern. Every effort he commanded should be made to repair the instrument. Above all, strict secrecy must be observed. Or let, to let it be known to the Egyptian public that their national relic had been smashed in the presence of the king by a British soldier could easily result in civil disturbance. This was the first in a series of incidents. Lucas, returning from a visit to Upper Egypt, collapsed when told of the disaster. He was taken to hospital, where his life was despaired of. The bandsman who had set in motion his, this chain reaction was suddenly posted to the desert. 
I began to wonder about the curse. Then the trumpet reappeared, restored and sounding loud and clear as before, as al almost simultaneously a trumpeter from another Hussar regiment reported for duty, Bandsman Tappan. Then came the day of the broadcast, a Sunday. It was to take place in the museum at six o'clock in the evening. And when I left, when I left my bungalow around 5.30, I was in a fair state of nerves. I drove alongside the Nile, grateful for the lack of traffic, when from a concealed turning clattered a runaway horse and carriage, forcing me onto the pavement against a lamppost. Although damaged, the car was drivable, and it was a shaken man who proceeded at a snail's pace for the remainder of the journey. At the museum, I was instantly surrounded by an excited group of engineers, journalists, and photographers. They had been trying to contact me, but my phone seemed to be out of order. The guards had refused to let them into the museum, which was closed on Sundays. Engelbach, the keeper, could not be found. The situation was desperate. The sun had set, the darkness was closing in. To my relief, Engelbach appeared in the museum with the museum key. The whole group of us raced up marble staircases and along echoing corridors to the galleries selected for the broadcast, only to discover that the electric power had failed. By the gleam of a pocket torch, the engineers began feverishly to connect their apparatus to batteries and lines, while I rounded up two bewildered watchmen and firmly took possession of their electric lanterns to provide light for Lucas and one for me to read by. In all that great building there were only two points of light, one where the engineers were struggling to get in touch with London, the other held above my head where it cast a pallid gleam on the drawn face of Lucas as he stood near the microphone. Five minutes to go. Then abruptly the watchman's lantern failed. Looking back it seems impossible, yet they flickered and died, both of them we were plunged into darkness. Miraculously, someone produced a candle, and with only that tiny flame flickering above the script in our hands, we were suddenly three to, through to London and the BBC. One minute to go. From the corner of my eye, I can see Lucas striving to look unconcerned, but the quivering of the script in his hand betrays his agitation. The half-seen treasures of Tutankhamun are in their cases all about us, grotesque and faintly menacing. Somebody clatters down the stairs, and something like a shudder runs through us while the echoes of his footsteps die uh, eerily in the distance. Slowly the second hand creeps to six o'clock. The voice of the announcer sounds in my headphones, we are now taking you over to the Cairo Museum. My cue. And now the two trumpets will be blown by bandsman James Tapper, who is here by permission of the colonel and officers of the 11th Prince Albert's own Hussars. I must explain that neither trumpet is easy to sound, and this is particularly true of the copper instrument. The silver one will be heard first. I shoot a rapid glance into the shadows beyond the microphone. Bandsman Tappern has raised the trumpet to his lips. Pray heaven, it's the silver one as arranged. I catch Engelbach's eye, and he nods encouragingly. Charles Workman, the announcer, is now standing, his face the color of parchment, ready to give the introduction. I have reached his cue. I raise my hand. I can see him draw a great breath, and then his voice rings out. The trumpets of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, Lord of the Crown, King of the South and North, Son of Bray. What fine high-sounding titles they are, and how his voice goes rolling down the corridors of time after 3,000 years. I look towards Bandsman Tapper and standing stiffly at the ready, trumpeter lips, awaiting my signal. He seems least affected of us all. 
Engelbach is leaning forward, rigid. Intense moment, this. Time and space will be bridged. We were to cross the gulf dividing us from ancient Egypt and for a few seconds breathe life into her dead bones. I drop my hand and sharp and clear this silver voice of Egypt's glorious past goes echoing to the four corners of the earth. Now the copper trumpet. So, after a silence of over 3,000 years, these two voices out of Egypt's glorious past have gone echoing across the world.